Hello and welcome to the Waters on Stanton video channel. My name is Peter Waters and thank you for joining me. A couple of uh, weeks ago we heard from Ellicraft that they decided to stop production of the uh, K3 transceiver. The transceiver that has been uh, um, the mainstay of DXs and the expeditions and so forth over I don't know, a 12 year period or so and uh, it didn't come as any real surprise because we knew the K4 um, was about to be launched. But I thought it would be perhaps um, an opportune time just to look back on the K3 um, and see see if there's still life in the K3 because I've got a feeling that the demand for the K3 will continue even though you can't buy a new one. So why don't you make yourself a cup of coffee, sit down and join me for about 15 minutes and we'll look back on the K3 and also the features that may still attract you if you're looking for a uh, second-hand one. The Ellicraft K3 was introduced around about 2007-2008 <clears throat> and it was quite a bold move by Eric and Wayne who up until that time had been manufacturing kits that were purely kits in component form. In other words, you had to mount the components, solder them, etc, etc, wind the coils. Um, but the K3 changed things. It was designed as a modular. Uh, transceiver and by module I mean that uh, these modules were ready built they were ready built and ready tested and all the customer had to do was to slot them in um, put uh, tighten the nuts and bolts up and so forth make the cabinet and uh, in at the end of I don't know probably 15 20 hours you had a working transceiver. And that was how the K3 was conceived. It was designed to be modular, didn't require any soldering at all. It was really a mechanical build, but it was educational because it did enable you to see what was inside the radio. And uh, it was also enabled you, of course, uh, to update the radio. There were two ways of updating it. There was the firmware update, and there must have been hundreds of firmware updates that uh, Ellicraft introduced over the life of the K3 <clears throat> in order to keep pace with what customers wanted, to add features and so forth. And the other way, of course, um, was to actually purchase additional modules. And these could be ATUs, they could be um, roofing filters, etc. So there was, there was quite a range of um, modules that you could put, could purchase in order to upgrade your radio and of course there are add-ons like the uh, the uh, p3 pan adapter and so forth which came along somewhat later the k3 fulfilled a function it was rather like a sports car a bulk of the expense was actually inside the radio the cabinet itself was just the cabinet to hold the radio um, unlike the Japanese uh, companies that spend obviously spend lots and lots of money in packaging their radios, in making the cabinets fancy, etc., etc., Ellicraft went down the sports car route. It was what was under the bonnet that really counted, and it worked. The uh, reviews they got from uh, the uh, ham radio press and from users, contesters, the expeditions, and so forth was positive, a very positive. It was a brilliant design. Right from the outset it was a brilliant design and uh, Eric and Wayne deserve a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, thanks for having the vision really to um, produce it and then also having the ability to actually put it into production, no mean feat. <clears throat> and the K3 was very popular with the expeditions because it was so light, so easy to transport, you could put it into a rucksack, it was carry-on luggage in an aircraft and it didn't add too much to the weight. Around about, uh, I think it was probably about four or five years ago now, um, they upgraded uh, the K3 to the K3S. <laughs> it always reminded me of the uh, Apple iPhone. You have the Apple uh, iPhone 5 and you have the 5S. And uh, about four or five years ago, Ellicraft introduced the K3S, which was uh, an improvement. Um, not it, well, it did improve the performance because the synthesizer was was uh, was was completely changed. 
but the, the, the basic transceiver was still there. And the good thing about it was that in many respects, and in most respects, you could actually upgrade your K3 to a K3S just by purchasing the additional modules, or rather the alternative modules. Again, very easy to install, didn't require any soldering. You could do it yourself, and it was designed for the customer to do it themselves with, uh, with instructions. And it carried on being probably the best uh, analog transceiver ever. And it stood up against transceivers costing two or three times the amount of money. The only transceivers that slightly improved in certain respects um, were the SDR transceivers like Flex Radio. But it was, we we're talking about that much difference. Um, and of course, we're talking about that much difference in price. So uh, Ellicraft uh, certainly had their followers and deservedly so. But there comes a time when things have to change. SDR was rapidly developing. Um, Icon were the first commercial um, operators, or when I say commercial, the first big commercial manufacturers to embrace SDR uh, in a big way, and they did it very, very successfully with the IC7300. Ellicraft were aware that they had to change things, um, but being a smaller manufacturer, there's, there's a time and a place for these, these things. And it is a lot, there's a lot of work and a lot of money involved in developing a brand new transceiver, particularly when it embraces SDR and all the other technology that's come on in leaps and bounds. <clears throat> and so Ellicraft had already made up their, their minds to produce the K4, although they wouldn't admit to it, and I think the rumours were rife for about two years. <laughs> when is the K4 coming along? And uh, uh, Ellicraft was said, well, we don't know, you know, we know nothing about it, etc., etc., as manufacturers uh, would say, wouldn't they? But it, Dayton in uh, 2019, they announced the K4 and they actually showed a, uh, a sort of a sample of the K4. Um, quite clearly, uh, the K4 was still in its development stages and we had Eric over um, from Ellicraft in uh, September of 2019, September last year, to talk about the uh, K4 and uh, the work involved, the design, etc., etc. At that time, the K3 was still in production, but Eric, Eric then had hinted that the K3 was coming to the end of, of its life. And the reason the K3 was coming to the end of its life was not so much because there wasn't a demand there, because quite clearly, um, from the phone calls we get, there is still a demand for a K3. Not everybody wants the all single to dance in SDR. Um, there's quite a lot that still want the super het, het uh, design uh, with top performance. But the problem for Ellicraft, like any other manufacturer, is that you have to commit to component supplies. Now, in the, in the case of the K2, which actually is still in production, it didn't require any terribly special components. But the K3 was different. The K3 required certain... Um, specific specialised components that meant you had to make sure you had a supply and you ordered in advance. And what happens eventually, of course, is that you have to make a decision. Am I going to order another 2,000 pieces of that key component, which may be quite expensive, and how long am I going to, is it going to take me to use up those components? And I think that's where Ellicraft found themselves. They found themselves in a situation where it made sense not to continue the K3 because to continue it would have required a major cash investment and in order to recoup that cash investment it could have taken a long time. So sadly, as I said at the introduction, uh, Ellicraft announced the cessation of the K3 um, a, a couple of weeks ago. But the fact that Ellicraft have announced that the K3 is no more, and they have actually run out now of uh, K3s, 
Uh, I think as we ourselves have actually run out. We may have one K3 left. We've got a couple of demo units, um, and I think we may have a, a, a second-hand unit as well. But basically, the K3 is now um, obsolete in terms of its availability. I shouldn't say obsolete, should I? No. Uh, the K3 is no longer available as a new item, which is rather interesting, because I have a feeling that there's going to be a the demand for the K3 for a long time to come. It's because of its size, because of its it's so light in weight, and because it's not overly expensive when you look at the performance and then compare what you'd have to spend to get that similar performance. Because the expeditions love it, and because people are still buying K2s, yes, we're still selling K2s, there is going to be demand for, a K, for, for K3s. And the only way that demand can be filled now is by second-hand units. So I think that if you've got a K3, it's been a pretty good investment because I don't think you have too much problem in selling it, if indeed you want to sell it. Um, if you want to buy a K3, then I suppose there is a, a bit of good news that the K4 is coming along and there will be quite a few K3 owners that want to dispose of their K3s. So I think there's going to be quite a nice market for the K3. Now, I've used the K3 for a long, long time. Not a K3S, no, a K3. And um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to run round it very briefly, the things I like. Now, it's not an in-depth review of the K3 that's been done time and time and time again, but just a few pointers um, about the K3 that I personally like, that, it, that appeals to me. They may be small to you, they may be big to you, it doesn't really matter. But to me, they are things that I enjoy with the K3. So let's take a little walk around the K3. Well, this is my well-worn um, K3. <laughs> which I've had for quite a few years now. Um, good selectivity and uh, IF shift. And if you want to um, get back to the original position, you just hold the controls in there and it sets it back to the, um, the neutral position for selectivity. It's got a pretty good uh, noise reduction. One of the good things about uh, the K3 is that uh, everything is uh, controllable from the, the front panel virtually. If I uh, press this metering button, you'll see we go from SWR and RF to uh, compression and ALC. If I want to generate a bit of RF for tuning, I just press that button there and I've got carrier going out at a pre-set uh, uh, um, power level. Press it again, you saw on the left hand side the SWR. But uh, you've also got a digital SWR uh, uh, meter built in. If you look, uh, as I press the tune button again, hold it in, you see I've got 1.7 to 1 SWR, a digital reading, and it comes at no extra cost. <laughs> it's got a built in antenna tuner. And if I want to bypass the antenna tuner, I just hold that button in and now we bypass the ATU. Hold it in again, got back to uh, the ATU in circuit. One of the things I like is that when you touch a control, uh, you very often get an indication on the display. Now I'm on sideband at the moment. If I touch the mic gain control, you'll see that the mic gain comes up on the panel and it gives me a digital readout of the level. Likewise, if I touch the compression control, up on the panel comes compression and the level of compression is shown and if I hold that same control in there press it once we now are able to control our power this is all done from the front panel and if I switch over to CW the mic gain becomes the speed control And if I want a separate receiver antenna, just for receive only, press that button in there. On receive, I'm using a separate antenna, but on transmit, I'm using the main antenna. 
nice if you've got some noise and you want to use a loop antenna. Moving over to the other side, I've got the preamp control and attenuator control uh, built in on the same button. And interesting control here, which says dual, which is very handy on CW. And I'll show you how I can find a signal. Now I'm going to hold this dual control in. That switches the audio filter in. And you can hear the signal just jumps out. There's another example, fairly weak signal. Audio filter in. Audio filter out. That's the spot one to uh, tune in the CW signal automatically. And you've got the button there, CWT. You know, we should decode CW <coughs> and PSK31 and um, RTTY on the screen there. There's lots of other controls on the front panel, but they're the ones that I um, thought I'd uh, just point out. They're the sort of controls that I use quite regularly. Now, on the back, um, it's a standard K3, um, except that I've got the extra um, IF board in there, which enables me to have a separate receiver antenna there, transfer to in and out if you need it, and also you can take an IF output from there. As this model's got the auto ATU built in, and you can always tell whether there's an auto ATU built into K3 if there's two antenna sockets there. The standard K3 has a single antenna socket, but uh, with the auto ATU, you get a sec uh, an extra antenna socket there. And it's also, this particular model has also got the two meter transverter um, built in, gives you about eight watts out on two meters there, and that's the uh, antenna socket. So um, just a few extras there. It's altogether a nice package, very light, easy to pick up. And your rucksack, well, so rucksack, fairly large rucksack. Anyway, it's carry-on luggage for an aircraft, that's for sure. Well, there we are. I hope you found that video interesting. Thank you for watching. And uh, if you found it useful or informative or just, <laughs> just interesting, please uh, press the subscribe button just to show that uh, we're um, on the right track. And uh, don't forget uh, the uh, ham radio store we operate here in Portsmouth. We'll be more than pleased to help you, whether it's Ellicraft or any other make of uh, radio, particularly ICOM and Yeso, we carry large stocks and we're always happy to uh, try and do the best deal uh, we can for you. So don't forget that. Give us a buzz. In the meantime, as usual, enjoy your ham radio. Thank you for your company. Bye.